faces out there. So thank you very much. Um, I came to creation uh, when I was living off-grid for 10 years. So when I hear there's a movement to off-grid, it's very difficult, but I found it very satisfying. Uh, but somebody that was helping us move had put a Bible in there. Now, I was raised in a religion where you weren't allowed to write, read a Bible. I thought it was written by one guy. I had no idea. So when you're off-grid, there's no TV, there's no radio, and I pulled out this green, I think it was the New Living Translation from the 70s, and I started reading, and I'm thinking, wow, this is heavy stuff. And when I got to Hagar, I hope I can say this, without crying. But she said, I see the God who sees me. Now, when you're living off-grid in the forest, you feel invisible. Nobody knows you. We'd moved up. We were a couple of kids moving up from California. But when I saw that he sees me, like even there, he became real in that moment. And Hagar was not a Christian. She was a Gentile um, that had been given to Ab Abraham. And and of course, then trouble arise, arose, but I just thought, that's what I felt. My whole life was upended. I didn't grow up in a Christian family, so I understood that feeling of not belonging and kind of being out of sync, and, and he still saw her, and he talked with her, and that was it. And I have not looked back since. So that's, that's you're going to see my passion, because I'm still in that awe to think that he sees me in you, in you, in you. And we feel like dots, right? We're, there's now eight billion dots on this planet. And he sees every one of us, and he loves every one of us. Okay, so do the math. Three plus one equals four, question mark. That's a formula, and we're gonna, at the end, we're going to finish that. The big question, were mathematics invented or discovered by man? And of course, you know, one side says that we invented it. But really, if we came from animals, and you're going to see the math brains in the animal world, they already had it before we even came along. You know, that's an evolution. But to me, that proves that there had to be a mind that designed that in those creatures' brains. And you're going to, we're going to be looking at the math brains of nature. If invented, then the language of the universe was created by humans. Imagine, the language of the universe created by humans. And if discovered, we must acknowledge intelligence developed a language that we can understand, because he is our father. So we have the mind of Christ. We can understand the language of God. That's an incredible privilege. Okay, so when did our interest in math begin? Our world is made up, and this is from Marcus de Sautoy. He was um, an Oxford, Oxford University um, mathematician. He actually created his own documentary, starred in it, because I guess if you write it, you get to star in it. Um, but it's fantastic. I hope you take the time to look at it. It's very, very interesting. Okay, our world is made up of patterns and sequences. One of the reasons mathematics began was because we needed to find a way to make sense of these natural patterns. And you see migration, we still see that, the phases of the moon, plants that bloom, and then they go to seed, and then they go to sleep during the winter and come back. So we see these patterns and sequences. We live on a duck pond, and right now migratory birds um, were in Linden, so there's swans in the field, snow geese, um, every now and then we'll see um, a bird that is probably was blown off course. He's all by himself, um, and he's in with the mallards on the pond. But it's so cool because it's just a reminder that of this movement on, in the natural world. Okay, the most basic concepts of math, space, and quantity are hardwired into our brains. Even animals have a sense of distance and number, assessing when their pack is outnumbered, whether to fight or fly, whether their prey is within striking distance, right? I didn't think about that, but he's right. That's Marcus de Sautoy. I really, um, I really enjoy his talks. So where did math originate? The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved moved upon the face of the waters. Now, I'm going to put some of those words into the original Hebrew to show it's a little different. So, but right now, we have water molecules without order, recognizable shape, or observability, right? That's what we have. So here's some of the words in the original Hebrew. The earth was confusion, a place of chaos and empty and dark obscurity, was upon the surface of an abyss 
of surging water. There was movement. It was dynamic. Surging water. So since math is about patterns, sequences, and predictability, God used math to change that chaos into order, unknown into recognizable patterns, and obscurity into predictable sequence of evenings and mornings, time. And time is a measure of math. See that? Isn't that beautiful? He used the math he created to form our world. So does God use math? I have an arrow on here, and I didn't know if you were seeing that arrow. I'm glad you're not. Okay. Does God use math? But the very hairs of your head are numbered. We quote this. It makes us feel special. Because honestly, who here cares how many hairs on their head? My husband's losing his hair, so he does care. Put your hand down. <laughs> but, but most of us don't care. Does he, he, the, does he not see my ways and count all my steps? Now we have those little step counters. They want 10,000 steps a day, right? Yeah, we count them. But prior to that, before that was invented, he was counting our steps. Since his days are determined, the number of his months is with you. He actually counts the time we spend with him, the days we have on this earth to follow him. You number my wanderings. You put my tears into your bottle. This is so touching. That word wanderings means wandering as a vagabond, somebody that has, uh, you've left God. And he, that's the tears in the bottle, is when we were away from him. And of course, he's always pursuing to bring us back. Isn't that beautiful? There's, it's so touching when you go into, you find out really the context of some of these verses. Yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure, and that order means to set in a row and arrange. There's the math. So he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He holds, I believe this is referring to this also, is the bonds of atoms, and we find order. Look at this, iron atoms on copper. And this is with that, um, was it, that tunneling microscope that can see atoms. Isn't that incredible? That's on your, um, that's on copper, and this is one on a nickel. And what they're amazed is these atoms are in perfect order. When you take a nickel out of your pocket, that's what you're pulling out. Isn't that something? So when did humans begin to use math? Then he, God, brought Abram, 1900 BC, outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. So this is the first person that will be asked to do this. The Hebrew word for count and number is safar. And write cipher, safar. Safar means to score with a mark as a tally or record, uh, enumerate to inscribe. Abram is the first to be told by God to physically inscribe, tally, record the number of stars. But why him? Where did Abram grow up? We have 400 clay tablets that are left over from Babylon. And this is called the Plimpton 322 clay tablet. And this reveals that Babylonians understood geometry, algebra, trigonometry, and fractions. And we didn't know that, especially the trigonometry. 400 clay tablets reveal Babylonian math remained constant for 2,000 years and was superior to Egypt. And Plimpton 322 proves they used trigonometry 1,000 years before Hipparchus, the Greek mathematician that we call the father of trigonometry. See, I, that's why I love archaeology. I love when they find these things. It's like, I love when it's a, what? It's, it's always discovering and research. We're wired to do that. It's so satisfying and exciting and adventurous, and he keeps it going. That's why his, there really is no, um, you'll never reach the depth, the full depth of his scripture. God did not randomly ask any human to count the stars. There was a reason it was Abram, because he could do the math. He came from that culture that could do the math. And God has, shows God has purpose behind his plan. Something as minor as, why don't you go count the stars? Because you can see about 5,000 stars with the naked eye, but there's a way to put them in groups to count them. Okay, so how did the founders of modern science view math? There is geometry in the humming of the strings, and this is Pythagoras, ratios for guitar frets. And if we've got musical, musically talented people here, then you understand this. Music and math are pretty much the same. And he says, and there's music in the spacing of the spheres. So there's um, math in the music and music in the spacing of the spheres. Pythagoras was 
5 BC. How could he have known the telescope, telescope would not be invented for 2,000 years. How could he know there in, indeed is a mathematical pattern in our solar system for the spacing of the spheres? And here it is. It's Bode, 1778. Bode published a three-step mathematical formula for the distance of each planet from the sun. And Pythagoras knew. He, I believe he was uh, inspired by God. Here's um, Galileo. Mathematics is the language in which God has written the universe. It is written in mathematical language, and the letters are triangles, circles, and other geometrical figures. So math is the language. It's a language. And it's without which uh, means it is humanly impossible to comprehend a single word. If we don't look at it through math, we're not going to understand it. That's what Galileo is saying. And we're going to look at this. You're going to be amazed how much math there is all around this. Where there is matter, there is geometry. This is Kepler. Where there's matter, there's geometry, and there's matter, we're matter. Geometry is one in eternal shining in the mind of God. Here, uh, Kepler is getting it. G God's mind is mathematical. They, that share in it, according to men, is one of the reasons that man is the image of God. He brings math into us being the image of God. And I have yet to hear in a church about the beauty and the, and the privilege of being in the, made in the image of God and putting math in that. We just don't think that way. Okay, here's uh, Newton, considered probably one of the most brilliant scientists that ever lived. Gravity may put the planets into motion, but without the divine power, it can never put them into such a circulating motion as they have about the sun. He developed calculus, apparently on his downtime, and um, was a theory about light, and was it, let's see, was it gravity? I wrote some of these. A law of gravity, new, a theory on light, and calculus. All variety of created objects which represent order and life in the universe could happen only by the willful reasoning of its original creator. And again, this is Newton. So is there a connection between math and the arts? Do we have any musical, creative people? OK. Um, what's another um, art? So besides music, um, basically art, um, drama, that's in the arts. Yeah, I, we got a teacher back there. Do you do drama for the kids? Oh, our, and the arts, that's right. Oh, don't kids naturally love to draw? It's not until we get older and we hear people saying, oh, that doesn't look good, and then we become self-conscious. But until then, it's wonderful to see that they're so pure about it. Like, oh, yeah, I can't wait to draw. I know, then we get kind of... Getting older can mess us up. But anyways, hopefully they go back to that. So here's math and the arts. Here's Alfred Whitehead. He was an English mathematician in the um, late 1800s. He said, you may fly to poetry and music, and quantity and number will face you in your rhythms and your octaves. He's saying they're together. They're the same. They require each other. Here's uh, G.H. Hardy, a mathematician's apology. That's the name of his book. The mathematician's patterns like the painters or the poets, must be beautiful. He's saying there's got to be art in the math, which who of us think that? I remember sitting in math class thinking this is not pretty. <laughs> I, I had to move from Massachusetts, which was in, um, they were doing classic math, and my dad was transferred to L.A. in the middle of seventh grade, and they had just started new math. So I might as well have landed on Mars. I had no idea what they were talking about. So yeah, there was nothing beautiful about that, but I appreciate what he's saying. The ideas like the colors of the words must fit together in a harmonious way. Again, seeing the art, the beauty, and math to, as together. Now, this is Bertrand Russell. He is a very famous um, atheist. He wrote a book, Why I Am Not a Christian. But listen, if you heard these words and not knowing who was saying them, wouldn't you think this was a Christian? The true spirit of delight, the exaltation, the sense of being more than man, which is the touchstone of the highest excellence, is to be found in mathematics as surely as in poetry. That would be something, it sounds like they're praising God. And here, it's just like a Balaam moment. He meant to curse, and out comes these beautiful words. This man, Robert Lawrence Kuhn, uh, simple abstract equations describe complex physical things beautifully and elegantly. Why should this be? He ha I've seen him on a, his show, 
And he, that's what he is. He's a, a questioning, intellectually curious person, and I appreciate that. He's, he considers himself an agnostic, but he, he searches, seeks, and asks questions. And to me, we should always remain intellectually curious. This is Marcus de Sato, who I was um, quoting in the beginning. He said, rhythm depends on arithmetic. Harmony draws from basic numerical relationships, and the development of musical themes reflects in the world of symmetry and geometry. So again, art and math are, are, are intertwined. So does God use math's, math's music to inspire and instruct? And when we get to the math creatures that share our planet, you'll see how they respond to the math in music. Call, we call it dancing. But they're actually responding to the beats, the measures, the tempo. It's very interesting. So God, how does God use it? Remember God um, sang a song to Moses and said, now write this down and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. And it was about how they were going to cheat on him, betray him, leave him. So a very sad song. But God actually, I would love, I wish Moses had written what it was like to hear God sing. His voice is described as many waters, thunder. He sang the song and said, tell them to put it in their mouth. Here's Ron Jericho. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. So music is part of their battles, their lives going through um, the wilderness. King David, the shepherd king, was a type of Christ. His psalm songs still speak for us and for us, uh, for us and to us even today. And this is my favorite. <laughs> when King Jehoshaphat had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. So imagine today if we had infantry and then the choir is in front of them and they're singing holiness to the Lord and here they come. And what would the enemy think? Is first they hear this beautiful music and we're going to war? Like, did it change anything? Is that why it was done? Or was this to empower the army behind them? But he used the music. And then midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns. And the other prisoners were listening to them. So God's music of math inspires, encourages, and strengthens us. He even used that for us. So what did today's mathematicians say about math? Now, when I showed this to a group on the San Juan Islands, there was a lot of teenagers, and they immediately recognized Arthur Benjamin. He's called a mathemagician. He gives them mathematical shortcuts that are like magic because they can do it in their head. So they were so excited, and I was so glad that there's somebody getting kids excited about any kind of learning. So he says math is used... Um, for calculation, which we all, that's pretty much where we keep math, calculation. But it's also application and inspiration. So calculation, simple and counting. Next one, personal, social, and global. And I made some notes on this about applying math. So when we think of computers, it's zeros and ones. Social media, how, um, what is it? You, like, you have likes and friends and ads. Uh, global trade and loans, that's all numbers. And then the last one is inspiration. Beauty in nature, art, and literature. Even colors have a formula. What's the percentage of these colors to make this color? If you go through paint swatches, if you're looking to repaint anything in your home, yeah, it's amazing how many whites there are, right? Off-white, warm white, cool white. Yeah, but they all have a formula to make that color. So here's Marcus de Sautoy again. He's professor of mathematics at Oxford University, and he'll be quoted um, throughout this. Uh, he wrote the BBC documentary in 2008, The Story of Maths. He calls mathematics the language the universe is written in, and we agree with him because it's God's mind that created the universe. This is Dr. Randy Palasok. He's an award-winning teacher. In 2014, he said math, he took it a little further. Instead of just saying it's a, a universal language, he said it's a human language. So he's answering our questions. Was it invented or discovered? He said it's a human language because it allows people to communicate because we can all understand it. So here's um, Eugene Wigner, and when he said this, oh, he, he makes comments that shows that he's wondering if there's a God, and then his peers criticized him for it. But I appreciate that he still said these in public. He said, the laws of nature must have been formulated in the language of math to be an object for the use of applied mathematics. 
And his book is The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Math in the Natural Sciences. That was his book. It's unreasonable. It doesn't make sense. Because uh, when, you, when you meet the math brains in our world, you'll, you'll understand what he's talking about. But he says the laws of nature, they must have been within that context, within the language of math. It, it's the only thing that made sense to him. Okay, so the, let's look at language. The definition of language, a systematic means of communicating ideas or feelings by the use of conventionalized signs, sounds, gestures, or marks with understood meanings. The understanding is key. Otherwise, without meaning, words are ink on paper, chemistry on matter. Right? That's all it is. Without meaning. Here's um, Philip Lieberman. He wrote his book, Eve Spoke, Human Language and Human Evolution. So we know where he, where he believes. He said, speech is so essential to our concept of intelligence that its possession is virtually equated with being human. So language, we have spoken, written, thought, sign language. We, that is really, for him, it is equated with being human. Noam Chomsky, he's a linguist, uh, MIT. He changed what we know about language because he studied, well, I'll tell you what, you what he studied. But it used to be until the 1950s, it was, under, it was believed that, again, with evolution on everybody's mind, it, that children learned language. They were a blank slate. I remember hearing that. Blank slate, you get to fill in their little brains. Now we know they're born with preferences um, and, and, and actually um, a gene for grammar for language. But we thought they'd just mimic what they heard. He said, human language appears to be a unique phenomenon without significant analog similarity in the animal world. So we really do have a different language. Animals obviously can make sounds and, and talk to each other, but we have the written language and we have this the different meaning. And we can, we're, um, we can connect past, present, future. I mean, we just see things much differently. So this is, I think this picture is so cute. But this is what he said. The innate ability of children to acquire the grammar necessary for a language can be explained only if one assumes that all grammars are variations of a single generic universal grammar and that all human brains come with a built-in language organ that contains this language blueprint, which of course means a designer had to put that in our brains. And this is how he, they, this is what settled it. In 1983, Nicaragua had a deaf school with 400 students who were unable to learn Spanish or lip reading, right? And so if we just learn language by hearing it, this should have been it for them. They would just go through life with, with no ability to communicate. But instead, outside the classroom, they developed their own pidgin English or pidgin language of gestures and signs. This is now the language taught deaf children in Nicaragua and proof of Chomsky's theory that language is innate. It's not learned with emphasis more on the meaning than the mechanics. We are born to want to communicate, to have to communicate. So experts call, this is a summary, experts call mathematics a language. Intelligence is essential to produce language. Our ability to learn language infers a built-in language blueprint that emphasizes meaning. Does scripture offer any clues to this built-in language? So glad you asked. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Logos is the spoken word with meaning and motive, because we have the Holy Spirit within us. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. There's the meaning. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The Word lives in me. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. There's that innate seeking so now let's do the math. Get ready. <laughs> prime numbers are the building blocks of all numbers because every number is built by multiplying these primes together. The pattern behind primes has yet to be uncovered. Did you know that? We still haven't figured it out. I love this. I love the surprise and dig deeper that God has planted for us everywhere. There are 37 trillion cells in the average human body. 37 is a prime number. Italian mathematicians developed a sequence known as the Fibonacci numbers. They appear in mathematics, computer algorithms, and nature. Each number is the sum of the two previous numbers. So you have 0 and 1 is 1, and then 1 and 1 is 2, and 2 and 1, 3. So we get how that works. Okay, and even in our, the bones in our hands. 
Oh, and Fibonacci, uh, Mozart used Fibonacci's sequence for one of his piano sonatas. Who knew, right? Within our cells, the DNA molecule measures 34 by 21 angstroms at each full cycle of the double helix spiral. 34 and 21 are Fibonacci numbers. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's everywhere. So here's information. This is first known Neanderthal cave art is a primitive hashtag. Can you see that, the hashtag? OK. This is considered language, a word, by some primitive person. I would love to know, I mean, was it just kids dragging something through the rock? But anyways, it's now a place where people go to look at it. But this is considered a word. But DNA, a three billion letter word or number digital code, is not considered language. But the hashtag on the rock is. I know. OK. In biochemistry, each protein consists of a string of chemicals, which are letters in a book. But to read this language and predict how the one-dimension string will fold up in three-dimension space, you need a mathematical dictionary. And again, Marcus de Saltoy is an agnostic, and even he, that's why I love when they're like, I don't know what to say. Ah, this, is, this is almost impossible. And he's admitting it is so complex. Because no advanced thinking, and this is Andrew um, McIntosh, who I think has spoken here, because I know he's spoken at um, Heinz's, uh, and he since, still sends us emails wherever he is in the world. Uh, because no, and this, so he's a uh, creationist, Christian. Because no advanced thinking can be allowed, there's no way nucleotides can arrange themselves in a predefined code. Where's the predefined code if there's no you know, advanced thinking? There should be no predefined code, since this assumes prior knowledge. He's saying it's impossible. Their own definition makes it impossible. OK, DNA's proteins. You want to come up here, Roger? DNA's proteins were assigned a musical scale. Um, so, you know, it, it go, um, so A and T and C and G are, go together across from each other, and they are obviously very different patterns. But anyways, they assigned a musical scale just to see if there was um, a pattern in our DNA. Now, when I play this, people come up to me and say, That's, there's really music inside my cells? No, there's not. <laughs> they just applied a musical scale to see if there was um, uh, music. Now, this is going to be a beta glo globin. Okay. Hello? I just want to make sure this is turned on. I just want you to know I've researched and practiced this for months to be able to perform this for you. This is my debut, so I'm a little bit nervous. Ms. O'King, could you hold my <coughs> Okay, beta globin. And tell me if you hear a pattern. Do, do you have the volume on your cell phone turned up all the way? I've been practicing for okay. much. Okay, 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 go ahead. Do you hear a pattern? Does it sound like music? So they do have different notes and instruments for each part of those proteins. Okay, now I'm going to have you go to a corin. So here, go to. Oh no, I didn't practice that. I one. know. Here, I'll do it. Um, let's see. We go like this, and we go to. Um, here it is. Right here. Okay. Hey, here's. Don't steal my thunder now. Okay. <laughs> here's a different one. They put different instruments, different notes. Do you hear a pattern? Yeah. You can actually go to a website called Genetic Music. They explain it all. You can listen to all different things. They're all different. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? So it shows that all of creation, including music and poetry, is built on mathematics, which applies to even the tiniest molecules. That is just so cool. All right, so let's get into life here. So this is Sir Fredward, Sir Fred Hoyle, astronomer, cosmologist, and mathematician from Cambridge. He said the likelihood of the formation of life from inanimate matter is one to a number with 40,000 zeros. That's a lot. It is big enough to bury Darwin and the whole theory of evolution. So we know he's on our side. OK. But here's the other guy on the other side. But even he, it's called Haldane's uh, like dilemma, I think it's called. So British geneticist and atheist evolutionary biologist, J.B.S. Haldane, so late 1800s, 
um, six, into the 1900s. He's on the evolution of humans. This was the formula he came up with. Of course, because it shows that it would be impossible, it actually proves our side. Um, there's a few scientists that have said they think he would, has it wrong. But, you know, I think they said that anyway. So the number of genetic deaths needed to secure the substitution of one gene for another by natural selection. So substitution of gene is evolution. Um, by natural selection is in the region of 30 times the number of individuals in a generation. So he's giving a formula of how many people it would take to actually mutate from amoeba to monkey to man. And he said there would have to be 150 billion forerunners of the monkeys now man. There would have to be 150 billion of them to you know, have, continue having these mutations of modern man lived on Earth. Where is the evidence, the bone piles in fossils and tools for these vast numbers of primitive humans? This is why it's called the dilemma for evolutionists. So is the fading sun um, or the um, dim sum. So there's uh, something about the sun would have been 20% less bright, you know, when it was when Earth was forming and things couldn't grow. So there's just they admit that there's areas where they it doesn't make sense. All right, this is evolutionist Stephen Jay Gould. He said that even if evolutionary history on Earth repeated itself a million times, he doubts anything like Homo sapiens would ever develop again. He concludes that humans are a glorious evolutionary accident. How could it be glorious an accident in the same sentence? I don't get that. Um, which required 60 trillion contingent events. So even he's saying it's impossible. And, and I love when they get that, because you know God is working on their hearts, too, and their minds. And he's like, man, this would never happen again. It's a, it's a one in a mi well, it's a one in ever. And he's right. God made humans. That's right. He's, he's headed to the right way. All right, here's chemistry. Russian chemist uh, Dmitry Mendeleev used mathematical patterns he discovered in the chemical elements to create the periodic table. He's actually the one that made that the ones that we dreaded memorizing in school, right? That we had to memorize that periodic table. And it has grown since I, since I was in school. Like, how many more things can they add? So this is what's beautiful. He was raised a Christian, lived in Siberia. His father died when he was 13. His mom now has him, and she recognized that he was very gifted intellectually. So she moved him to Moscow uh, so he could go to school. While he's in school, his mother dies. So he just stayed faithful to the Lord, and in a dream, he saw the elements lining up, and he got up and wrote it. And his genius is seen in the fact that he left blanks for future elements to be discovered. That's, I mean, that's a gift from God. And here's how he, when he finally made his, the, the periodic table, he dedicated his book, Principles of Chemistry, to his mother, quoting her last words to him. Refrain from illusions, insist on work and not on words, patiently seek divine and scientific truth. This lady is ahead of us. She puts divine and science together, Bible and science together. They're not separate. They're not on opposite sides saying, forget it, you're, you're um, full of it, or you, what you say doesn't make sense. She put them together, and she's correct. Scripture is full of science. In fact, when, you, when we meet somebody that doesn't believe, we start with science, because you know they believe in science. To start with God, that they've already made a decision doesn't exist, um, yeah, it's just going to be kind of a round and circular um, conversation. But we start with the science and say, you know, they had no telescopes or satellites back then, and uh, how would they have known this? How do you think they would know this? It just opens up the conversation. Okay, plants. Okay, here's the golden ratio. So we got fiddleheads for the ferns, we got a succulent, pine cone, cabbage, and sunflower. And we talked about the Fibonacci number. So now we're going to get into the golden ratio. So as plants grow, the leaves average 222.5 or 137.5 degrees from the previous leaf, which maximizes space and light for each. Spiral pattern allows for center of gravity to remain constant. Even the leaves, we walk past bushes and plants, and we don't even think of the detail and the math God put in each one. I'm just walking by and... Boy, they look beautiful, but I don't stop and think of the details he put into those. Okay, I love carnivorous plants. So my husband has, um, when people come to our house, we just have carnivorous plants as house plants. I know a lot of people think that's odd, but it's so great. When you hear a fly and then it goes, and you think, 
Got it. I don't have to scrape its guts off the wall. It just took care of it. So, so Venus flytraps, I absolutely love. So the Venus flytrap, I, can you see, right? See where the, it's, the bottom part is. See the little tiny hairs sticking up? Not the, what looks like teeth sticking down. But see those? They're kind of lighter colored. Those are hairs that have a built-in timer for 20 seconds. Not 18, not 22, 20. And of course, they still don't know how that is. Why does this, how did this plant evolve a 20 second timer? And why is the one that evolved a 20 second timer and this one over here, or that didn't even exist where this one was, why didn't it evolve a five second timer? Like, it's 20 seconds. Okay, so what happens? Insect touches hair number one. The 20 second timer starts, starts, it's, it's begun. A second hair has to be touched within the 20 seconds and the trap will close because it has to eat a live insect. And a live insect will touch the two hairs because it's still moving. But if you put something dead in there, it's not going to touch that second hair. So then as the insect starts struggling, um, then the digestive enzymes are released. I know it sounds gory, but I, like I said, I love it because <laughs> I don't have to mess with the fly. Um, so what do you think? Isn't that amazing? A 20 second timer in something, they only grow in a stretch on, I think it's North and South Carolina, some kind of bog area. And that's the only place they grow in the world. And just them, and they have a 20 second timer. Okay, here's, here's a, this is amazing. Are you ready to meet a plant that can do the math? Brainless plant can do the math. I now have no excuse if I say, oh yeah, I just don't have a math brain, you know. No, if the plant has a math brain, that means we humans all have a math brain. Researchers once believed plants break down starch at a fixed rate during the night so that 95% is used at dawn. So that's what they would find is that, so with photosynthesis, they make sugar and starch, and they put away a little bit of starch because their system, their processes, are still have to be fueled at night when the plant is asleep, not really asleep, but I mean, it needs that. But it, it's, it has to calculate... Um, the using of the starch with how many hours before dawn, and then the light will come back on and it starts rebuilding its supply. So that's what the plan has to calculate. Again, no brain. <laughs> and oh, and by the time they, they need 95% of the starch gone by dawn because they're going to start rebuilding the supply. But Arabidopsis, I think that's the mustard plant, was observed recalculating that rate when mean humans randomly subjected it to 16 hour nights. I know, they've got it, they've got them in a the lab. And they're 12 hours of light, 12 hours of dark. So they've got them in the schedule. And then one day, they turn off the lights. So they're now 16 hours of night that they had no time to prepare. That's why the season slowly, you know, we get brighter and darker because the plants are given time to adjust. Like I said, mean humans. They shut off the light and saying, see what you do about that. Well, guess what? The joke was on the humans. This is what they had to say. These are guys that work in this lab. They said, these dynamics, because what they found is they immediately readjusted and started putting more starch because they had to use it. And again, while trying to calculate how many more hours till dawn, and, they, and then at dawn, they were still left with 5%, was still all this left. It says, these dynamics require an arithmetic division computation between starch content and how many hours till dawn. We introduced two novel chemical kinetic models capable of implementing analog, so input, output, similar, arithmetic division. The plants were doing arithmetic. Can you say, praise the Lord, for putting a, reminding us that, <laughs> that God is in all these everyday things, and they are so much more complex. We're going to look at what God told Job, and this is all going to make sense. Now when you read this, what he asked Job, you're going to say, ah, oh, because now we know how complicated these are. And obviously it's his fingerprints on who designed them. Okay, roots. Who cares about roots, right? They're under the ground. We don't see them. All we care is that the plant grows up on top. Well, wait do you hear about this. Same plant. It can grow in agar, allowing us to watch how its roots grow. When protons flow into the cell wall, the wall stretches, and the root tip lengthens, so it stretches and gets longer, and then the plant cell sucks the protons back out almost immediately. So what that creates is the cellulose strands lock in place to strengthen the wall, pause and repeat, root tips pulsing every 20 seconds, mathematically, 
pulsating every 20 seconds. Not randomly 10 seconds, 20, 50, whatever. 20 seconds. So now it's compared to this. This is, this is a University of Wisconsin botanist, and he said, the chemical regulation of these pulses is highly complex. Everything's coordinated. It's like a dance with the entire complicated ballet occurring up to three times per minute. He had to compare it to a ballet because he had never seen anything like it. That's all he could compare it to is how complex roots that we don't even see. Wow. Okay, slime mode. Now, there's a guy, um, a, a scientist. The first scientist was a lady. She was fascinated with these. Her dad was a scientist, and she just grew up being in the field with him. And so she's kind of called the queen of slime mold. I don't know if you want that title, but she, I think, held it in high regard. Uh, but there was a man in America who spent like almost 70 years studying slime mold. And you know what he said when he finally retired? There's still so much more to learn. Now, I've put mulch out, and slime mold appears. It's yellow or orange on my mulch. And I'm like, ah, you know, so I kick it loose because I don't want it eating up my mulch. Now, when I see it, after I've heard this, I'm going to show you. You're going to be amazed. I get so excited, there's slime mold in my garden. I can't wait. I'm, I'm hoping there's more, and this is great. Uh, so here's, here's how amazing it is. It's an amoeba. Now, I'm going to show you. Uh, they can live in separate, um, separately or as a... Um, they, they come actually together to make a bigger... Um, unit, I guess for lack of word, what it is, because it's not a fungus, it's not a plant, it's not an animal, it's totally different. Um, so what I'm going to show you is fast forward, a fast motion of a, a single um, amoeba, it sends out a signal, and wait do you see what comes to it. All these others hear the signal, but they don't have ears. They smell it, but they don't have noses. They don't have brains. They figure out where it is, and they combine so they can get more food more easily, apparently. I know, weird, right? Okay, but that's not even the best part of slime mold. Now I get why that man said, oh, there's still so much to learn. So they come in a variety of colors and patterns. One type actually resembles dog vomit. Now how, how does it even know what dog vomit looks like? To go, yeah, put some brown and gray on my back, and yeah. But when um, my husband and I were living in Squim, our neighbor had apple trees. And when they moved, they told us, help yourself to the apples. So we went over there, and the deer were over there all the time, wolfing down the apples. Well, one time, we saw what looked like the deer had thrown up, ate too many apples. It was slime mold. It was feeding on probably rotten apples, and it looked like vomit. And so we just went, oh, that's gross, and we just didn't bother with it. But now, now that I know, I wish we would have you know, at least peeked under. So you can see they're beautiful. So here's what's amazing. This is a gift. So slime mold can do the math. They're healthy eaters. They love oats. So there's an oat in the middle. You see it just found it. But they can do, they will quickly find the most efficient way through a maze to reach food. Yeah. And so you can see on the on the left, it starts to go down, and then it says, oh, you know, dead end. And then this one is coming around and finding it because they love their oats. So here's what, here's what some, a guy did. So on the left, the slime mold in yellow is where Tokyo is. And all those little white oats are the surrounding uh, suburbs of Tokyo. So in five hours, he was just curious how slime mold would find the most efficient way um, to each of those oats. So in five hours, you see, he's got a few oats are there. And in 16 hours, he's, this um, slime mold has done the whole roadway. And that's exactly what they did. On the left, slime mold network on the top and the actual Tokyo Railway network on the bottom. And over on the side, right, is the slime mold for the UK and the actual UK roadway map. <laughs> so this could put city planners and engineers out of work, right? Because when they're going to develop you know, how do we get from this major city to the, to the um, outer neighborhoods? Have slime mold do it for oats. In 24 hours, you have your map. And of course, you can allow, the humans can say, well, there's a hill there or a lake there. That's OK. You're going to have most of it done for free. I mean, these, right? Are you impressed with slime mold? Isn't it unbelievable? <laughs> it's what? Oh, tiny. But, but I mean, when you're walking in the woods, when you see them together, you'll see them on a rotting log, and you'll see it's kind of like, it's not mushrooms, it's not, it's flat, 
And of course, it's, it's, we see the orange ones where we are in Linden, um, but it's, up, it's, it's eating the rotting wood. So it looks like um, somebody took a plastic piece of orange and just laid it flat on there. So yeah, you can see them. But yeah, I think when they're single, you wouldn't, wouldn't notice them. But when they come together, and you know, they're like people. Well, maybe I feel like getting together with you, and I think I'll be alone. Yeah, you see both. I know, I love that. Like I said, now I get why that guy was so fascinated with slime mold and why that woman said, call me queen of slime mold. Where, where, do, you get to, where do you find out about this thing? Okay, so here's the commentary from uh, Life Science Magazine about slime mold doing roadway, um, con uh, roadway engineering. The work provides a fascinating and convincing example that biologically inspired pure mathematical models. That's what they're now calling slime mold. So forget slime mold doesn't do it justice. Biologically inspired pure mathematical models. That makes them sound so much better. Can lead to completely new, highly efficient algorithms able to provide technical systems with essential features of living systems. It says slime mold beats humans at perfecting traffic network. And they have no brain, and they're ahead of us. I mean, yeah. So see, I, I hope you're as fascinated with slime mold as I am. OK, let's go to insects. From a mathematical and engineering perspective, hexagons are one of the best shapes for construction. So this is, um, this is an entomologist. So we're going to look through, I think it's called an electron microscope. These are butterfly eggs. So look at the detail of, and a lot of times these are, um, the butterflies lay them under leaves. And remember how we're just passing by the bushes not thinking of their mathematical formula for their leaves, but we don't even see these. These are often tucked. So even things we typically won't see, look at the beauty and detail God puts in this. Here's another group, another, and another. Just butterfly eggs. And look at what he put into it. He didn't have to put the beauty in there. The patterns, it's just beautiful. The one on the top right looks like chocolate, um, like something at a, like at a wedding, chocolate with little cream on the top. Oh, man. All right. Australian stingless bees store their honey and brood cells in a golden racial spiral comb. Look at that. Perfect. How would the bees know that unless it was put into, designed into their brains? So... I was in, I wasn't a salesperson, I was in marketing, sales was a result, but in marketing, it's all about connecting. You find ways to connect with so many people, and when you have at least five visits a day, you have this, the, flying, uh, the salesman, traveling salesman dilemma, is how do I make it the most efficient to reach that? So they wondered if bees could do it, right? They go from flower to flower, and this is in the UK, so what they did was they attached a radar transponder, which I'm sure the bee loved, stuck on his back. And they made five stations with nectar, and it was in the fall. Nectar's rare. And each, each station provided one-fifth the amount the bee could carry to keep them from coming back and forth to the hive to, to motivate them to visit all five stations while carrying this thing on their back. Guess what? They aced it better than humans. It, oh, and of course we had to have a press conference, but here's what they said. It shows that bumblebees with their diminutive one milligram brain, side of a grass, size of a grass seed, are capable of finding nearly a perfect solution with relatively few attempts. Out of 100, 120 possibilities, in 20 or less, they got it. And in a relatively short time. Bees, I know. They're, I mean, they're amazing anyway. They're really an organism with 50,000 brains. It's not because um, they all communicate at the same time. And they figured out sales, uh, the traveling salesman dilemma. And here's the man uh, delivering this to the humans. Before this study, such sophisticated learning was thought to be something only larger-brained animals were capable of, as in humans. Um, this is at the University of London. London. But he's saying, and here we have tiny brain, and they figured it out. So in other words, we've just, we now have a much bigger picture of stopping to underestimate the small creatures and realize that the same creator made them all because they all have amazing qualities. Here's bee and wasp's nest. Okay, this is the first half of the first line, um, and your, name, your brain's going to go numb before you get to the end of it. It's called the Delaunay triangulation, and this is 
Um, again, very complex, and I, I just did the beginning, the straight line dual, the Voronoi diagram, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but what's amazing, you and I would have to be a mathematician, but bees and wasps have it already in their brain. They do this. This is how they build their hives. This Delaunay triangulation, and I'm going to show you. So look at the four dot, or five dots, one, two, three, four, five, it's six. Six dots on the upper left, that's what you start with. And then just go to the across on the top right, because the one on the bottom left, it says it's a non-triangle, so we don't care about that one. So what the, the theory is that each dot, you connect them with lines so that you have triangles. And then a circle shares the dot that the, each point of the triangle is shared by a circle. And so you see the bottom right, there's the triangulation. That's how bees and wasps build their nest. One uses wax, the other uses paper, and they have these little tiny brains. And they're doing math that is high level math because God put it in there. So to prevent, so here's what's amazing. So they use this, and to prevent gaps, so you saw uh, they all have hexagonal cells, you know, six-sided. But they have males and queens that are bigger larvae, so they need to make some, a few bigger cells for those babies. But to do that, because the hexagonal works, you know, all these sides are pressing against each other, it makes it really nice and tight, and then you've got these bigger ones, well, at some point you're going to get gaps, or, or um, you know, have problems. So these, they now add, they're called pairs, five, seven pairs. There's a five-sided five -sided cell, cell and seven, so uh, pentagon, uh, septagon, right? Am I saying that right? Um, so five, five, seven pairs, and they start putting them in specific places amongst all the other hexagonal to cr keep the order. And they said there's a certain point they all know, put in some five, seven pairs here, here, here. And then it works. There's no gaps. There's no collapsing of part of the, um, the hive. They do that. Isn't that something? And they're using, again, high-level math. OK, here's the Rip Van Winkle of insects, the cicada, equipped with a timer and a thermometer. But what's interesting about the timer, is, I mean, the thermometer, is when the soil gets warm, they know, like, OK, we can, we can emerge. But they don't. They wait 13 or 17 years. Notice those are prime numbers. So they have a timer that goes 13 years or 17 years. I barely remember five days of what I'm supposed to do. And so they're like, oh, OK, it's going to be next year, because I know this is year 12 and year 13. There are seven species of cicadas in the eastern US, four with 13-year life cycles, and three with 17. That's it. Those are your two types, prime number and it's exactly those numbers, I mean, those years. Wow. OK, the ants. Oh, this is amazing. You're going to love this. There's a lady in, I think, New Zealand or Australia. Her office, now think of a typical business office, her office has obstacles and freeways for ants. She works with ants all, and of course, we'd all think, oh, that's horrible, because when you get ants, you want the exterminator. No, she, she's, she's challenging them and finding out, like the bees, way more going on in their brain. All right, this is uh, the this is University of Sydney. This was on their um, the, uh, headline for Wired. Taking traffic control lessons from ants. Because we humans can't do it, apparently, but the ants can. OK, so here's, here's, a, here's an example from her office. Um, and you can go on her website. It was um, Dussur, uh, du oh, Dusator, or Dusator. Dusutor, um, it's a woman, and she's, she's, just a, she's just a character. Anyway, so look at the top, and you see the nest is on the left and food is on the right, and that's typical is you've got ants coming from, you know, they have food in their mouths, and they're going back to the nest with the food, and then on out, the two outer lanes, you have ants leaving the nest to go get food. So you've got this constant back and forth, back and forth, um, providing, bringing food to the nest. Okay, those are army ants. The leaf-cutting ants... So you see the two outer lanes, the ants are going away from the food, going back to the nest. But in the middle, so you see some of the ants that are holding leaves in their mouth, and you see ants facing them. Well, guess what? When congested, when congested, traffic officers will block ants from leaving the nest or force ants to go around them, which slows them down and changes the traffic flow. Isn't that great? But they, they can, they get where, you know, okay, we're having a, a possible, um, 
you know, jam up over here, so we're going to slow this group down. That is thinking, and again, God put that in their mind, that they can understand traffic flow. This is amazing. Scientists tried for eight years. I would have thought one year would have done it, but they needed eight years to create traffic jams with ants. The humans failed. The ants kept marching. They, they could not cause a traffic jam, but again, wouldn't they have known that in one year? <laughs> eight years they tried. When opposing streams of leafcutter ants share a narrow path, they instinctively alternate flows in the most efficient way possible. Studying how ants manage this could provide the basis for, are you ready for this? Something we're all dreading, a system of driverless cars running on ant traffic algorithms. <laughs> are we ready for that? <laughs> but again, it's showing, I mean, they, they, they can do something that we can't. Okay. This is an ant co um, colony that they either put resin or concrete in, so you could just see the complexity of it. They build amazingly complex and stable structures, and uh, cue in on the word stable. So Jose Andrade at the California Institute of Technology and his colleagues set up miniature ant colonies. Now, I think this is, I love insects. So to set up, you're setting up ant colonies in all these um, containers, and so then they, they positioned every ant and every grain of soil was captured by high-resolution x-ray scans every 10 minutes for 20 hours. Because ants, remember the word stable? They don't have cave-ins. Humans still have cave-ins, right? When we were mining, we have cave-ins. That was always a terrible thing to happen. Ants don't. And so why is that? So look on the left. This is the, the soil. They discovered ants, I hate this, stumbled upon soil physics. No, they were designed to understand soil physics. They form arches that strengthen their tunnels and prevent cave-ins. So you can see on the right, the ant has started, and they're moving grain. So when you see ants just kind of going in and out of their nest, and they're, they've got, uh, they're bringing soil out or something in, it's not random. They're specifically knowing which grain of soil, um, soil they can move. Uh, the forces on the grains, gravity, friction, and cohesion, would shift the soil so it wraps around the tunnel axis as the ants excavate it, so it actually gets stronger. Ants. Now, they did not stumble upon the physics. They totally get it. And they know it naturally. It's innate because God designed them that way. So guess what we're going to do? If this behavioral algorithm can be analyzed, if it can be analyzed and replicated, because we can't figure out how they do it. So we have to figure out, first of all, how they do it, and then we've got to see if we can replicate it. It might find application in mining robots on Earth or in other planets. So they want to put it in human machines because it's beyond human thinking. The ants have it figured out, oh my word, how can we replicate it? So this is what's beautiful. It's called um, biomimetics. We're starting to see that God's nature was way ahead of ours. And we're trying to recreate what God has done. Okay, here's locusts. So this is King Solomon. The locusts have no king, yet they go forth, all of them by bands. And that word bands in Hebrew is army ranks. So that's what it says in scripture. The locusts have no king, yet they go forth, all of them by bands by army ranks. I'm going to show you a leading researcher of locusts, and he almost repeats that word for word. He, too, saw the same thing King Solomon said. All right, so a lot of us think locusts are a totally different species. They're actually not. Your green, long-legged, weak-flying, solitary desert locusts go through a change, and it has to do with hormones. And their legs get shorter, their wings get stronger, their color changes to black and yellow, and they swarm instead of being solitary. It actually transitions into a locust. So here they are. Crowds of gregarious locusts will suddenly decide to march. But, and, here's, and I'm quoting the uh, researcher. But they do so without leaders. These aggregations form marching bands. And so you can see them all going the same way. And I'm going to show you his, um, I'll show you his picture. Uh, I read, I grew up on National Geographic. I still, we still read science journals. Um, but he, this young man said to study locusts, and I'm going to tell you why he studied them, he brought 20,000 of them into his lab. So of course, all his coworkers had to wear giant goggles, something across their mouth, and look like hazard suits because locusts are flying through the air. And when the reporter went to do a story, the first thing that happened is the locust smashed itself into his goggle. Can you imagine you walk in and so, yeah, so it gets better. All right, so he, this was Red Orbit online. 
Here's Ian Cousin, one of the top 10 young scientists in 2010, studies 20,000 swarming locusts in his Oxford lab. I, don't, I wonder how many girls visit him, right? Because to walk in there and have things in your hair. All right, his findings. At a second critical point, the clusters would become a single marching army. Haphazard milling became rank and file. That's using similar words to King um, uh, Solomon. So here's what he did before I tell you uh, why. So picture this lab. Things are 20,000 locusts flying all over the place. Okay, and, and they would be everywhere. They're on the windows, the curtains, your clothes. He, every morning, uh, there was like a picture of NASCAR oval racetrack. And he would count, let's say, well, he'd just start counting. One, two, and he's putting a locust one at a time, counting, and somebody's checking, and they're all like this, just milling around, what, I'm in this location, and he just keeps adding. And then, at a certain number, they all turned the same direction and started marching, like that. Nobody talked, they didn't give a signal, it was that number because now they're rubbing up against each other and that is triggering the hormones. And they all start marching because at the end of the day when they were counting, you know, taking them out, there were always a few missing. Because if you're not walking in step, you get eaten. While they're marching. <laughs> yeah. So talk about motive to keep marching. Okay. And this is why you study swarms. Because when normal cells change, duplicate, and congregate, they can then swarm into nearby structures as cancer. This is a really big study. I mean, it's been going on for years. One time I was speaking, uh, I'm trying to remember which city that was, and there was a research um, doctor in the audience, and she knew exactly about this. She knew all about it because they're reading the results of the swarm studies. But isn't that interesting? Spiders. This is Darwin's bark spider. It is the size of your thumbnail. Size of your thumbnail. Now, for those of you who have worked it for uh, construction companies that do dirt work or own construction companies, you're going to be amazed. You're going to think, why didn't we hire this guy? OK, he was discovered in 2009. We didn't even know it existed. It builds the largest orb web in the world up to 30 square feet. Remember, it's this size, and it has material in that little body to build a 30 square foot web. And that web is 10 times stronger than Kevlar. Now Roger was a cop and he wore Kevlar vests. And to think it was 10 times stronger, like why wasn't he wearing that, right? <laughs> why didn't they buy us that? That would have been better. Okay. This tiny spider will cast an anchor line over 80 feet long across rivers and lakes it gauges distance and material needed. From where it's sitting on this bush, 80 feet, it, it knows the distance and the material needed to cover that distance because God put that ability in that spider's brain. How can such a tiny spider estimate distance, material needed, and then produce the enormous amount? And we watched uh, a BBC documentary on this, and so it shows the spider, and she's doing this, and she's, oh, and they crimp it to keep it, you know, not, instead of flying all over the place. And so what it does is the, the current carries it across this river, and then on the other side, you know, it'll stick to another tree or something over there. Well, there was another bark spider over there, and he's like, oh, somebody's got their web coming to my tree. So, so once her, the first one, I'll put, this one's a she, this will be a he to follow it. Anyways, her web sticks, so he comes running over, like, I'm going to take over. And she can feel that he's on her web. So she comes out. And I'm thinking, oh my word, we're going to see a spider fight. That, that tiny. <laughs> no, you know what she did? Man, this was great. I, I told Roger, I'm going to remember this. She came out there and she stared at him. And he stared at her. And then she cut the web and he went fling down to the river. <laughs> so it was like, that was even better than fighting him. Just, <laughs> you're done. And so then, so then she has to climb back up her web because her, her, her part swung too, but she knew, she knew the distance. So she climbs back up. Now she's eating all the web over that. It was 100 feet. She's eating it. And then she pauses for a second and then looks back and sends out the next one because she knows he's in the river, so she doesn't have to worry. Isn't that something? I know. 
And remember, King Solomon said about the spider takes hold with her hands. This spider, as the spider sends out liquid web, it takes hold with her hands to crimp the lines. And you see it every few seconds, she's crimping it, crimping it. And so it's crimped. The, the, it's, you see the, jet stream, the jet's coming out. So there's several, and then she crimps it, so it keeps it together, so it goes in one direction. I know. And look at the, here's a guy looking at one of those. They're found around the world from villages to king's palaces. Bef okay, now again, here's our, here's our press conference on this. Before spider silks can be subject to genetic engineering for commercial applications, we're going to try to figure out how we can make it, the complete protein sequence and their functions, as well as the details of the spinning mechanism, will require additional progress and collaborative efforts in the areas of three different branches of science are going to be needed of humans to come in and figure this out. Biochemistry, molecular biology, and material science. We need three, three brilliant people from all these to figure out how she spins it, what's it made of. Because commercial applications, yeah, that, think of that would put it on our soldiers. Ten times strong, as strong as Kevlar, that would be fantastic. But see, we are wowed by this. Okay, but there's more. In 1832, a young man named Charles Darwin found the ship had been invaded by thousands of baby spiders. They were 60 miles from Argentina. How did they get there? Every day, 8 million lightning strikes turn the Earth's atmosphere into a giant electrical circuit. Our upper atmosphere has a positive charge. The ground has a negative. Silk from a spider picks up the negative charge, which repels the negative charge on which the spider sits, creating enough force to lift them into the air. It's called electrostatic repulsion. It's similar to same charge magnets. When you put them, remember how it repels them? So look at what they do. They detect the electric field. They stand on their tippy toes, aim their abdomen upward, and send out a stream, and off they fly. Ah, that's why you find them in places you never thought you'd find them. Yeah. See, this brilliance is all around us because of the designer. Here's pikas. They're so cute. They're like this long, the teeny little things, uh, like a short-eared rabbit. They live above 8,200 feet in elevation. They have to have boulders um, and mountain slopes. And uh, they only weigh six ounces, and they spend their days chasing each other away. They don't have any friends. They're always very territorial. And so they live alone. In the long mountain winter, winters, though, they do not hibernate. Wouldn't you think an animal that lives that high would hibernate? No. They, they survive, but they have to provide a stack of food in their little, their little hole in the rocks. And here's the mathematical formula. They need 60 pounds. This requires 14,000 trips. They put cameras on them. It's 14,000 trips, 25 per hour for 10 weeks. There's the formula to get your hay. And it is hay. Because once they get them, they lay them in the sun to dry. Like hay. During the rain, yeah, they go out and move it, and then they bring it back when it's... But yeah, it's called haying. If, for those of you who've lived on a farm, you know about bringing in the hay. Yeah, well, these guys do it, but they, it's 60 pounds. That gets me through the winter. Doing the math. Okay, here's birds. We all know what this is, right? Starlings. Murmuration. Now look how the two separated, and now they can actually go through each other, and the birds stay like within their group. Look at this. Ah, you'd think there'd be birds falling down. Nope, they do this. This is what's amazing. Giorgio Parisi, he's a theoretical physicist with the University of Rome. He led a research team to study starlings. And don't you love that murmuration looks like a bird? Findings were published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2010. So this was a big deal. He said one bird's movement only affects its seven closest neighbors. Why seven? And this was his answer. It's just one of those numbers that works in nature. Well, we know why. God loves the number seven. I just thought that was great, though. Each starling just pays attention to the seven nearest neighbors. A signal, now this is amazing, a signal from a single individual can cross a hundred wide, a hundred yard wide flock in a fraction of a second with virtually no distortion or diminution. So a signal from a bird ripples through as strongly as it started. It's, and they don't know how. The closest thing they can get to, the closest fit for this behavior comes from the physics of magnetism and describes how the electron spins of particles align with their neighbors as metals become magnetized. 
Starling flocks behave like flying magnets. This is what, the, here's the commentary on it. To achieve their extraordinary coordination, starling flocks in flight behave mathematically like magnetized metals. Their formations don't just transcend biology, but span multiple, multiple physical phenomena. I mean, this is God's fingerprints on this, and that they can't see it. I mean, birds, and of course starlings. I mean, they're invasive, they're annoying, they're, they're always trying to nest on our roof, and we've got to run up there and put mesh, to, and then they ma they're mad at us. But I mean, and here they're brilliant. The, how, how they, because of the brilliance of the one who made them. Okay, I love this. There's a new mathlene town. So whenever you have somebody saying about, yeah, we're related to primates, um, sometimes they say it's because their eyes are in the front. Well, so are kinkajous and kittens, and what's well, another animal? It has, you know, I don't hear about that, that we're related to kinkajous. Um, and then they also say, oh, because of they, they're smart, they can um, do these math tests. And then there was another thing. Oh, and we share so much DNA with them. Well, it used to be like, what, 95%, 97% they, we shared DNA with um, the primates. I think it's been knocked down to 70%. But they don't tell you the next two animals are cows and mice. You know, the next in number. Like, and not far, far behind that number of sharing don, uh, DNA is cows and then mice. So when they say that, I'll say, oh, yeah, and, and you know, the 87% is with cows. Oh, I always, just to see what they'll say, like, Cows? I go, well, I mean, it's, doesn't it make as much sense as a monkey or an ape? So this is what's great. The researchers who did tested pigeons' ability to do math, they sent it to the primate researcher in the US saying, here's the parameters, here's the double blind, this is, did we do this correctly? Um, these are the results we got. And she said, oh, you must be testing primates. They didn't tell her it was pigeons because they thought she'd have a bias. So then they told her, no, it was actually pigeons. So pigeons and primates are equally smart. So how smart are the primates, right? I mean, it kind of knocked them down. And so it says there's a new mathlete in town. This is in New Zealand. Pigeons have shown they can learn abstract rules about numbers and ability that had only been demonstrated in primates. I love that how God puts in, it's almost like humorous. Yeah, I'm going to throw up pigeons. I mean, nobody thinks about pigeons. Uh, yeah, have them be just as smart as the primates. Chimps and pigeons both scored 75% accuracy. And what they're doing, I want to show you what they're, so the pigeon has to be able to count. They have to peck at the, uh, the group of objects that are less. Less is first and then more. That's how you start. And so they have to recognize what is less objects, what is more. And they did it. They had no problem, just like the chimps. OK, reptiles. How do sea turtles find the exact beach where they were born? Scientists have known that turtles, like many animals, navigate at sea by sensing the invisible lines of the magnetic field, but they didn't know how they were able to return to the spot where they were born. So two hatchings who had never been in the ocean were brought to opposite sides of the Atlantic. So it was, I think it was North Africa and Florida, maybe. And they were brought to opposite sides, same latitude, but different longitudes, right? One headed southwest and one headed northeast. The results demonstrate that turtles use a kind of bi-coordinate magnetic map in position finding, an ability that has long been hypothesized to exist, but never before demonstrated. The precise way in which turtles' magnetic map is organized is not yet known. We have a lot of those, right? Huh, how do we mimic the spider silk? And yeah, which I'm glad. I'm glad we're in awe. OK, mammals. Here's your con uh, connecting opposite corners of squares, the logarithmic sp a spiral called the golden ratio. It goes wider by 1.6 pi for each quarter turn. So here we've got, we've got an ibex on the right, bighorn sheep on the left. The equiangular spiral growth never changes its basic shape, keeps the center of gravity constant. I'm sorry, the ibex on the right, I would think major headaches. But it, you know, and these things run up rocks with that balance, that balancing you know, of that kind of, of horns. Here's Mr. Pennings, a mathematician and professor of calculus, and here is Elvis, the demonstrator of calculus. <laughs> You're going to look at your dogs differently after you see what Elvis can do, because apparently all dogs can do this. Did you know dogs know calculus? Right? I, our daughter is a math brain, so when she would do calculus, it was all these pages, and I'm thinking, how do you know? And she goes, oh, I love it. You just kind of keep following it. She loved it. But our dogs didn't show any interest in it, and now I know. We should have, Roger, we should have been telling them. OK, Mr. Pennings observed and measured hundreds of ball retrievals by Elvis to prove he had an innate, innate ability for minimizing the time of travel to a target. And I'm going to show you how he had the diagram. 
but Elvis had to figure out his to minimize. He has ocean or beach. So the ocean, he's got to swim, which is going to take a lot more time, and beach, he could run faster. And it would require traversing these different mediums at different speeds, because he had to figure out how to get to the ball the fastest. So A is where Mr. Penning stood, and B is where the ball ended up, in the water. Elvis would run, to look at the red, he would run most of the way on the beach, and then do a slightly angled swim to the ball. A few times he went to where he was exactly lined up with the ball and would swim straight. And his timing was always fastest when he did the red line, which is calculus. I know. Like I said, I, I had to tell my dogs, well, I'm expecting a lot more from you now. <laughs> now that we know you can do calculus. All right, look at this. A pianist plays for elephants. Are they moving to the music or the math? And we know they're moving to the math. Look, at, I love this. That girl is not afraid to swing her rear end and dance to that music. So even toddlers, have we all seen a toddler get excited when they hear the music and start? Yeah, from toddlers to elephants, we move to the music of the math. If anybody's been around cows, I've lived on two cattle ranches, Roger's worked on one. Cows have a mild curiosity about you, but they're not fascinated, which I don't blame them. We're not fascinated with each other either, so why would they be? But when you play music, they actually line up, and with some uh, videos, you'll see they come running. And they're just like, notice none of them are eating grass. Typically, when they come over to look at you, they kind of look, and then they start eating. These guys are watching them. They, they love, music speaks to the animals. And of course, music is math. Juno the beluga, when the guy would show up at the mariachi music, because <laughs> sink down and just loved it. So now we're in space. This is Bertrand Russell, that atheist. Um, he said, physics is mathematical not because we know so much about the physical world, but because we know so little. It is only in its mathematical properties that we can discover. So it's the math that we can see physics. And it's, when we talk about a fine-tuned universe, it's because of the math. So this, uh, with the James Webb Telescope, this is something that they saw and they don't know what it is. They call it WR for Wolf Rayet um, type of star. I love how they describe it. It says they live fast and die hard. Now, doesn't that sound like a description of some guy you knew that was, you know, never settled down? Yeah, he said, well, live, live fast and die hard. And isn't there a series of movies called Die Hard about some macho guy? Okay, yeah. Okay, well, apparently these stars are like that. Yeah. Um, so, so the scientists for the European Space Agency and the others that were looking at this, they observed 17, see those, those circles? 17 three-dimensional geometric, they called them nesting shells because they were, you know, but, but part of them are square. They're like square and round, and they're squishy. And they said because it's 3D, they have to use a geometry model. So here he is. Here's the, here's the scientist trying to figure what this, is, what this is. He said it reveals squarish, equidistant ripples surrounding the star, something European Space Agency science advisor Mark McCaffrey described as bonkers. He's like, this is bonkers. And this is what he said. He said, for coming up with an explanation of the shells, he goes, it's not immediately obvious to me. Because <laughs> if it's bonkers, right? I mean, there's no logic. I love that. Not immediately obvious. So if gravity was stronger by a fraction of a percent, atoms would pull together into one ball. And if gravity was weaker, the expanding universe would have distributed atoms so widely they could not have gathered into stars and galaxies. So here's our fine-tuned universe. Ratio of electron to proton mass is one, 1 to 1836. The mass of a proton is exactly 1,836 times the mass of the electron. If this ratio were smaller or larger, molecules could not form, including DNA, the blueprint for life. That's how fine-tuned, when they talk about it, that's how it's right on the edge. If the speed of light varied slightly, it would change the other constants and prohibit life on Earth. And this is our universe in x-rays. Isn't that gorgeous? What is obvious, even though he said it wasn't obvious, to us what's obvious is our universe is fine-tuned for life. All right, so the big question, was math invented or discovered? The big answer, both evolutionists and creationists believe plants, birds, and mammals existed before humans. Since these organisms demonstrate an innate ability for math, math must have been discovered, not invented by humans, because we weren't even there in the evolution model. We weren't there when they were having mutations and making their way to making us. And if discovered, both sides believe intelligence is required for this universal language. 
So when Job questioned God, God pointed to his creation for the answer. He didn't make it a straightforward answer. He pointed to his creation. Were you there? Where were you? What would he learn? But now ask the beasts, and they will teach you. And the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Because I've been tell showing you what they have been teaching us about God, the designer. Or speak to the earth. Think of the insects, the plants, right? We've looked at all of those. And it will teach you. The fish of the sea will explain to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? It's the only explanation that makes sense. In whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Now, further on, he says, Do you know the time when the wild mountain goats bear young? Or can you mark when the deer gives birth? Can you number the months um, they fulfill? Let's see. I had little notes here. All right, here we go. So this, okay, so this is time, and time is a measurement of math. So when we look at it through the mathematical filter, he's asking this about, do you know the time when they bear young, uh, how long they're carrying, the number of months they fulfill? Okay, then we go to the horse. Have you given the horse strength? Have you given it? I gave the horse strength. Have you given the horse strength? He paws in the valley and rejoices in his strength. He gallops into the clash of arms. He devours the distance with fierceness and rage. So here is speed and strength, both measurements of math. And the last one, does the eagle soar at your command and build its nest on high? It dwells on a cliff and stays there at night. From there it looks for food. Its eyes detect it from afar. They can see a rabbit two miles away, which would be like us standing on a 10-story building and seeing an ant on the sidewalk below, which we couldn't. And he's saying, so here is distance and height, all measurements of math. So when God asked Job, pointed to creation, isn't it obvious to you? Who has created these? What they can do? And Job got it. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. I see your works and your creation. The creator of beauty, patterns, design, order, math, he saw it. So the greatest equation in the universe, three plus one equals four, three nails plus one cross, forgiven. Three persons plus one human, for who? You. For what? Life. For when? Eternity. And for why? Love. So I need somebody... Do you still have, you want to get the mi microphone, Roger? Yeah. And you can stay back there, honey. You don't have to come up here. Oh. Yeah. Your, your moment on the camera is done. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Honey, I want you to read what's on the right side of the screen, okay? So now we're going to summarize what we learned about math. Math is a language requiring a mind. For God. Math's beauty is breathtaking and unexpected. So loved. Math is inclusive of all cultures. The world. Math reveals purpose and planning. That he gave his only son. Math is measurable and logical. That whoever believed on him. Math has tangible, absolute results. Should not die. Math is unaffected by time. But have everlasting life. How precious, now here, I'm going to read you a couple verses. Do you see the math? How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count to them, they would be more in number than the sand. Many, O Lord, my God, are your wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts towards us cannot be recounted to you in order. They are more than can be numbered. Thank you. We have a calculus expert in the back. Yes. That was that was truly awesome. We just oh. so appreciate you for coming. You, oh. Would you would you just go ahead and close us out in a word of prayer? Oh, you bet. You bet. Oh, precious Lord. Oh, precious precious Lord, our Savior, Messiah, uh, the Father, the Spirit, Lord. What you have done, not only within us, Lord, but what you have done all around us, because we live in a natural world. We 
have nature around us, above us in the skies, in the dirt below us, Lord, and your fingerprints, your brilliant mind has designed them, that we, no matter where we look, how far we run away from you or refuse to look at you, Lord, we see your works, which should turn us back towards you, Lord, because you take care of all this, the balance, the symmetry, the complexity, Lord, and you love us. I mean, we are the ones you died for, Lord. May we never underestimate how much you love us, how much you are in the details of our life, and how much you look forward to us being with you forever. In your precious name, amen. Amen.